shall rise up as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the Bible study. Thank you because you brought us together for a good purpose. We ask you, know, Lord, as we have prayed, that you break up every fallow ground present here and in all the various locations where your word is heard and launched today. In Jesus' name, we ask you, know, Lord, that your spirit will come down mightily. And we pray, Lord, that the sword of the spirit, the word of God, will pierce every heart and will cut away everything redundant in every life in Jesus' name. We're asking, O oh Lord, that we come as one before your presence, that Lord will realize that we honor you, we respect you, and we glorify you, we lift you up as we open our hearts to you to hear your word. We pray, Lord, that that spirit of learning will be upon everyone and will learn your word together to profit in Jesus' name. That Lord, those who are here and you know have not been saved, you will convict them and you will draw them to yourself and you will grant them the faith to believe, to turn away from their sins and to receive Jesus as their personal Savior in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that we are sanctified by the truth. Therefore, as the truth of the word of God is coming out, we pray, Lord, the desire to be holy, the consecration to be righteous, and the faith to get sanctified, you grant to everyone in Jesus' name. Our prayer, Lord, is that the word will not be void and will not be useless and worthless in our lives. We pray, no, Lord, that the word of God will do its work in every heart and will draw us closer to the Lord in Jesus' name. Bless everyone today as we learn together in your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Today we're looking at the word of God and we're learning together from Revelation chapter 15. Actually, this is the shortest chapter in the whole book of Revelation. And it has a close connection with the previous chapter and also a close connection with the chapter that follows. And it's telling us that the time is coming. It gives us the assurance and the pledge that the time is coming when God will judge the worshippers of the devil. Those who worship the Antichrist, those who worship the beast, particularly it's related to the time of the great tribulation. And it's telling us that at that time, when the judgment takes place, eventually there will be the ultimate triumph of all who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and keep the commandments of God. It's an introduction actually to the chapters that are following. This chapter then gives us the details of how the predicted judgments of God will be inflicted upon all that dwell on the face of the earth in the latter part of the great tribulation. The details are given with solemnity. And we who learn, we who hear, must also learn and hear with the kind of sobriety that it requires. Let me read the chapter to you. In Revelation chapter 15, reading from verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw a sea it were, a sea of glass, mingled with fire. And them that had, that had got in the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in white, in pure and white linen, and having their breasts guarded with golden girdles and one of the four beasts the living creatures gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of god who liveth forever and ever and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of god and from his power and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled 
That's what we're looking at today. That's what we're studying together today. It talks about the final wrath of God. The full wrath of God. The outpouring of the wrath of God. And actually this chapter, as we have seen, stands like an introduction to all that we're still going to read concerning the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the indignation of God, and the fiery indignation of God concerning or upon the people that have worshipped the Antichrist, the people that are not worshipping the Lord. And when we talk about the wrath of God, it's not only at the time of the Great Tribulation. In fact, all through the Bible you learn that the fierce wrath of God, the judgment of God, is upon everyone that will not follow after the Lord. Even the people that lived in past generations, they suffered from the wrath of God, the judgment of God, because they did not follow after the Lord. And the people at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord warned them. And John the Baptist, of course, warned the sinners in his own time. And he told them that if they did not repent, they will face the wrath of God. So the wrath of God is not only revealed in the book of Revelation. Have you read Genesis chapter 6? The wrath of God, the judgment of God upon the people at the time of the flood. I about Genesis chapter 19. That's the wrath of God, the judgment of God upon Sodom and Gomorrah. I about Egypt in Exodus, the wrath of God, the judgment of God coming upon them because they had in their hearts and they will not obey the voice of the Lord. Even the children of Israel themselves at the time of the kings and the time of the prophets. How the Lord visited them with in his anger, in his wrath. The wrath of God came upon them because they will not follow after the word of God. And the king of Israel, that is David, he warned the people of the wrath of God because he told them that if they do not believe on the Lord, the wrath of God will come upon them. If you look at um, at some two, reading from verse 11 and verse 12, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, kiss the son, lest ye be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. It's telling us there that for the sinners who will not follow after the ways of the Lord, the wrath of God will come upon them. In fact, he tells us that uh, the wrath of God is not limited to this earth. It's not limited to the time in which we live. That the wrath of God will also be in eternity for the people that forget the Lord, for the people that do not worship the Lord. In Psalm 11. Sorry, Psalm, Psalm 9. Reading from verse 17. It says, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. And so you learn that the wrath of God was not limited to the time. It's not going to be limited to the people of the time of the great tribulation. But the wrath of God, which is the punishment that comes upon the wicked, has been from of old, and is even until now, and will continue even until the time of the end. In Sephaniah, Sephaniah reading from chapter 1. Again, we are told of the wrath and the judgment that comes upon the people that do not follow the ways of the Lord. Sephaniah chapter 1 verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and his death greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man, shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble. And a day of distress, a day of worseness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fence cities, against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. You will see then that when we talk about the wrath of God, the fullness and the final, the finality of the wrath of God, you see that we are talking about something that had been of old and it is still there today and will be very much there at the time of the great tribulation. In verse 18, it says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured. By the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even his speedy readers of all them that dwell in the land. As we open the pages of the New Testament, 
the people of the New Testament were not ignorant that the wrath of God will come upon the people that do not follow after the ways of the Lord. John the Baptist was very clear, and John the Baptist was very faithful to the word of God as he spoke to the people. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And so you will find that all faithful preachers of the word of God, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, at the time of the kings of the prophets, or at the time of John the Baptist, or even at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were warned about the coming wrath of God. And even Jesus Christ himself he spoke about it in John chapter 3, verse 36. John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him and so then you will see that all faithful preachers of the word of god in the old testament or new testament they have been faithful in declaring that the wrath of god will come upon the sinner romans chapter 2 in romans chapter 2 again we're told about the coming of the wrath of god indignation and anguish upon the people that will not follow after the ways of the lord it tells us in verse 8 chapter 2 verse 8 but unto them that are com contentious, contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness there will be indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to the Jew force and also to the Gentiles as we then come to the time of the great tribulation the thing you learn in the great at the time of the great tribulation is that there will be wrath and as we come to chapter 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. But as we look at the book of Revelation, and that will not be the first time we are meeting that word, wrath, judgment, punishment, upon the people that do not fall after the ways of the Lord. Far back in chapter 6 of Revelation, chapter 6 of Revelation, we're looking at it from verse, uh, from verse 15. It says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, he themselves, and the dens, and the rocks of, of the mountains, and said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? So then, as we come to this uh, Revelation chapter 15, we're looking at the final wrath of God, the full wrath of God that will come upon sinners, will come upon the people that do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not live to his glory. The people that do not live to his honor, the wrath will come with them. I've read the chapter to you already, and the chapter opens with the appearance of seven angels. These seven angels having the last plagues that will be filled up, that will accomplish completely the wrath of God. Then those that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image, they will sing rejoicing because of their victory. In the latter part of the chapter, the temple of God is opened in heaven. And the seven angels having the seven plagues receive commission to empty their vials full of the wrath of God upon the earth. That's what we're looking at today as we examine the details of Revelation chapter 15 verses 1 to 8. I divide the chapter to three parts. Number one, the seven plagues of vengeance and wrath. The seven plagues of vengeance and wrath. Number two, the song of praise, victory and worship. The song of praise, victory and worship. Then number three is the source of power and the vials of wrath. Let's come back to number one, the seven plagues of vengeance and wrath. Please look at Revelation chapter 15 verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven. Great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. 
John the Beloved is the one that is still receiving the revelation. And then he has written about you because the Lord said, write what you see. And saying to the church, the whole church, represented by the seven churches of Asia Minor. And in the revelation that continues, he says, I saw another sign in heaven. A sign. That's a wonder. And that sign of wonder is designed or calculated to hold the mind in astonishment, in amazement or wonder. It was beheld by John the Apostle. It was a sign or a, ter or a, sign or a wonder of terrible judgment coming upon the earth. He said, I saw this, something that will amaze you, astonish you, surprise you. A sign, a wonder in heaven. Great, marvelous, and uh, he said, it is surprising. It is represented as appearing from heaven because the judgments are coming from heaven and they are falling upon the world, the world of unbelieving people. And the world of the people that are there at the time of the great tribulation, the judgments are said are great and marvelous. That means they are shockingly great and they are overwhelming. Seven angels he saw having seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Well, you understand as you look at the angels, as you study the angels all through the Bible, when the angels come to the believers, the angels are ministers of mercy to the saints of God. But those same angels are ministers of wrath, ministers of judgment towards sinners and all the enemies of God. The seven last plagues will be, will be the worst calamities and judgment to be inflicted on the inhabitants of the earth, those who forsake the true God and those who follow the Antichrist during the great tribulation. The plagues will be the expression of the climax of the wrath of God, the indignation to be poured out upon the unbelieving world of the unrighteous people living in the world at that time. God has always been working to save men from his wrath. But the people that reject his mercy, they will have to face the wrath of God. Please come back to that revelation again, chapter 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign. I've been seeing other signs, and he had seen a lot of signs in the book of Revelation. Then he said, another sign now. And it's coming from heaven, great and marvelous, overwhelming and shocking. Seven angels having the seven last final plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. It just just uh, open to Revelation chapter 16 and see the performance of those seven angels. As these seven angels continue to pour out and pour out and pour out the wrath and the ignition and the judgment upon the world of unbelieving people at the time of the great tribulation. It says in verse 1, chapter 16, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and he poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and, gr and grievous sore upon men, which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And then the second one in verse 3, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as blood of a dead man. Every living soul died in the sea. And then before that even ended, number three, the third angel, and the third angel in verse 4 poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters. And they became blood. And then he said, I had the angel of the waters saying, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast thus judged. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And then it goes on in verse 8, it says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And the men scorched, and the men were scorched with great heat. And blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him the glory. In verse 10 it says, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, that is the Antichrist. And his kingdom, the kingdom of the Antichrist, was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain. It goes on in verse 12, and it says, and the, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the great and the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. 
And then it goes on in verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven. And from the throne saying it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men while upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And a great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. You will see then that as these seven angels will be pointing out their bells upon the earth, that judgment, indignation, wrath will be poured upon the people living on the earth. It's not completely new. Were the people of the Old Testament ignorant of the time coming, at the time of the Great Tribulation, when everything will be totally disorganized, and rocks will be flying here and there, and the sun will be darkened, and the moon will be darkened, and then there will be judgment upon the people living on the face of the earth at that time. Is that all new? Is it a new revelation that God was giving to John the Beloved? No, not at all. It's been from the time of the Old Testament. Isaiah spoke about it. Jeremiah spoke about it. And Ezekiel spoke about it. And then Nehum spoke about it. Sephaniah spoke about it. All the prophets spoke about it. Daniel spoke about it. Let's turn to the Bible and look at a few of the references. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. I'm reading to you from verse 9. In Isaiah chapter 13, reading from verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the gold, golden wedge of offer. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. I shall warn the people. He said, the day is coming. And every proud person, and every haughty person, and every covetous man, and every sinner, and everyone that is not working according to the word of, and the will of God, that the judgment will come upon them. It will be a day that will burn with fierce anger and the wrath of God. As you read about all this, are, are, are you unconcerned? Are you unconcerned that the wrath of God will come upon the people of the world and that if you are not ready for the coming of the Lord, you will be here at the time of the great tribulation and it will be a terrible time because none shall be able to abide. As Isaiah spoke about it, Jeremiah also spoke about it. Jeremiah chapter 10, looking at verse 10. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble. At his wrath, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the indignation of God, the punishment that will come upon the sinners that do not repent. At his wrath, the whole earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. There will be nobody so strong that you will be able to abide the judgment of God when that day of judgment comes. That's the reason at this time of mercy, at this time of salvation, you want to call upon the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Grant me your salvation so that I can escape the wrath, the judgment of God, which is to come. As we come to the New Testament, we're told it's not just for the Old Testament people that were warned concerning the wrath of God. Come to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, we see the warning of the Lord that the wrath of God comes upon the people that live in sin. That wrath comes now in a way. And the wrath comes upon the people that are living on the earth now that have not given their lives to the Lord or the people that backslide and they go back into sin. 
and they dishonor the Lord and disgrace the name of the Lord by living in sin. Wrath comes upon them. Judgment comes upon them. And of course, if they die under the chastening rod of the Lord, if they die under that wrath of God, and they go into eternal wrath, eternal fiery punishment, which is a terrible sin because they suffer in the lake of fire forever and ever. And that's why the Lord is saying, this time, the time of mercy, this time, and the time of grace, this time, the time of the dispensation of the love and the grace of God, is when you need to come to the Lord and just bend low and bow before the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy on me. I need your salvation because it is only salvation that makes you to escape from the wrath and the judgment of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It gazes all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Do you understand that verse? The wrath of God, the judgment of God, is revealed from heaven. And there is nothing to hinder, and there is nothing to restrain, and there is nothing to limit, and there is nothing to withstand or withhold. That judgment of God, that trust of God, it is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. That means it is revealed against all forms of ungodliness. Wherever ungodliness is found, it may be hidden in a religious man, or hidden in a man that is not going to church. That judgment of God, that trust of God, is revealed against all forms of ungodliness. In fact, it tells us against all unrighteousness of men. Every form of unrighteousness, whether it is practiced in the public or it is practiced in the private, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the indignation of God, the fierce anger of God comes against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness. In fact, it says against all men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And you know there are people that know the truth. They know the truth mentally. They know the truth in the head. They know the truth as a doctrine. And they're holding on to that truth. And if you ask them about salvation, they'll tell you. If you ask them about holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, they'll describe it to you. If you ask them about the possibility of being sanctified and the meaning and the significance of being sanctified, they'll tell you. If you ask them about the righteous standing of a real child of God, they'll call the verses to you. But look at this. They are holding that truth in unrighteousness. There's no change in their lives. They have the gospel, they have the message in the head, they don't have it in their heart. Their heart has not been changed. They are as dirty as sinners who have never been saved. And they are as corrupt, as polluted as people that have never had the gospel. They hold the truth of God, they hold sound doctrine, but they do that in unrighteousness. It says in verse 19, because that, that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. Which means that actually they are not ignorant of the very fact that you can be saved. There's a God in heaven who loves the truth. There's a God in heaven who proclaims the truth. And there's a God in heaven who wants people to come into the truth. They know all about it. And they know all about that God. The only thing is, the unrighteousness is so important to them. Ungodliness is so important to them. They're not going to get saved. They are holding the truth and the sound doctrine in unrighteousness. Look at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness. What kind of unrighteousness when it says they hold the truth in unrighteousness? Are uh, there not people that come to a church like this and they hear the gospel? And they hear the word of God. And it is not that they are ignorant of what the Bible says. But the only problem is they are holding on to unrighteousness. And the Bible is warning such people if you are there today. And I know some of you are there. You have been coming for such a long time. The only problem with you is that you will not surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And be born again and have transformation and change of life. And you are holding on to the doctrine. And you are saying I belong to a good church. I belong to a church that is preaching the word of God. And I know the word of God. And you are even saying, I will never leave this church. But you will never leave as the word benefited your life. Or are you holding the truth of the word of God in unrighteousness? What kind of unrighteousness? Verse 29, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. Malicious and full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. You know, there are people that, as for doctrine, they know doctrine, but gossiping has not led their lives. 
as for doctrine, they know doctrine, but covetousness has not left them alone. It says they are backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, implacable. And those are the people, if you offend them, it's very, very difficult for them to forgive. They cannot forgive. And they keep on, they keep on, they keep on repeating that offense. No matter how many times you might say sorry, 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 70 times, 7 times, they never can give. The implacable, they come to church, they read the word of God, they hear the word of God. The problem is they are holding the truth and they are holding some doctrine in unrighteousness, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What are we saying? What we are saying is what the Bible is saying, that the wrath of God is not limited to the time of the great tribulation, that the wrath of God is even now upon people that are holding the truth in unrighteousness that will not give their lives to the lord that have the truth in the head but they do not have it in the heart in romans chapter 2 verse 3 and thinkest thou this O man that judgest them which do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of god or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearing and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. You know, when we hear the word of God over and over, and we refuse to surrender and submit ourselves to the word of God. And we harden ourselves against the truth. Here verse 5 is telling us, After the hardness and the impenitent heart, you treasure up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well doing see glory and honor, immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil unto the Jew first and also unto the Gentile. The word of God is warning us then that wrath will come, and it comes even now, even today. But you know, at the time of the great tribulation, it will be at the time of the concentrated wrath of God being poured out upon the people that do not know God, upon the people that do not care for the righteous demand of God upon their lives. And then they go ahead and they take the mark of the beast. When they take the mark of the beast and they worship the Antichrist and then they forsake God and their doom will be sealed forever. Then wrath will come and there will be no remedy. Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 9. In Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 9, And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in, his, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the bees and his image, and whosoever is receiveth the mark of his name. But it is still the time of mercy. And you can still have the wrath of God escaping you or overpassing you, passing over you. If you will give yourself to the Lord. That's why the Lord has sent his servants, all his prophets and the preachers of the gospel, telling us that we can be saved. We can give ourselves to the Lord. And we can escape from the wrath to come. If you will flee from the judgment of God and you flee into the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, today is not only the preachers who are preaching from the pulpit all believers are the ambassadors of Christ preaching and calling sinners to repentance and you if you are still a sinner there you've been coming you've not been born again you've been attending the Bible study and having come into the church you've not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ 
here is another opportunity for you as the gospel of grace is coming to you that you can repent and turn away from sin and receive forgiveness from the Lord and receive the favor and the grace of God so that you'll escape the wrath and the judgment of God. All who obey, all who repent, all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, receive grace and then they live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. And then they are delivered from the wrath to come. They are delivered from the wrath to come. But let me remind you once again, if you keep on coming and you neglect or reject salvation, and you don't have the real salvation of the Lord in your heart, in your soul, and with the evidence of a change of life, how will you escape the judgment of God? Because it tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. As to come to the Bible study, and as you hear the word of God, you ought to give the more honesty to everything that you are hearing, lest they should slip away from you. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? How shall we escape the wrath of God? How shall we escape the judgment of God? How shall we escape his anger, his punishment? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Well then, this is time to give yourself to the Lord and to say, yes, Lord, I understand now. If I continue in the hardness of heart, in penitence of my heart, I know that I will perish. I don't want to perish. Therefore, I give myself to you. And when you come to the Lord, the Lord will receive you. I said the Lord will receive you. And he'll give you salvation. And then if you keep on walking in the Lord, and walking in the Spirit, and following after the ways of the Lord, when the trumpet shall sound, you will be among the number that will go with the Lord. And then you'll escape the judgment and the wrath of God forever and ever. I come to point number two. The people that escape that judgment. The people that escape that indignation. The people that do not suffer that wrath of God because they overcame. And because they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by their faith in the Lord, therefore they are not suffering the judgment of God. Revelation chapter 15, reading from verse 2. And I saw a seat where a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had, that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the arms of God. And he sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord? Glorify and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Here we find the victorious people singing the song of praise and the song of victory, and they worship the Lord. It tells us the people that did the singing, those that have gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. As those that were delivered at the time of Pharaoh, uh, they were delivered from, the, from Egypt, from Pharaoh. And they were delivered from the judgment of God. The death that came upon the firstborn in every family. When they came through the Red Sea, they celebrated their deliverance with a song of praise and thanksgiving. So the same way, these people, the redeemed of the Lord, in Revelation chapter 15, will also celebrate their deliverance with an appropriate song of praise. It will be a song of redemption. A song of rejoicing. A song of release. A song of remembrance. Uh, there's something for us to notice about the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. The Lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you just put all the pieces together, the song of Moses was sung at the Red Sea, but the song of the Lamb will be sung at the Crystal Sea. The song of Moses was, sung, was a song of triumph over Egypt. The song of the Lamb will be the song of triumph over Babylon. The song of Moses was uh, told, he, he told them, he told us how God brought his people out of oppression. The song of the Lamb will tell us, 
how God brings his people into glory land. The song of Moses commemorated the execution of the king of Terah. But the song of the Lamb will celebrate the exaltation of the Lord, the triumphant King of Kings. The song of Moses was the first song in Scripture. The song of the Lamb will be the last song in Scripture. And so, as we look at their praise, at their worship, at their victory, at their singing, we learn quite a lot of things. Come back to Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw a seat where a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the halves of God. The people that sink here are the people that had the victory. How did they have the victory? The Bible tells us how, how they had the victory. And it tells us how you too can have the victory. Victory over sin. And victory over temptation. And victory over the flesh. And victory over the bad habits of your past life. Victory. When you have that victory. And victory over the suggestions of the enemy. That you should worship the Antichrist. Or worship an image. Or worship this and worship that. And you have the victory over all those attractions and enticement of the devil. Then you'll be able to sing the song of the Lamb. It tells us how to have that victory. In First John chapter 5. I'm looking at verses 4 and 5. First John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. That's how to have the victory. An empty bag cannot stand upright. A sinner cannot live like a saint. A bird cannot live in the sea. Neither can a fish fly in the sky. Something ought to happen to you before you can have the victory. You need to turn away from your sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how victory can come to you. If you are there and you are saying, I want to live a victorious life. I want to live a righteous life. And then every time you do something wrong, you slap yourself, you punish yourself, you go and fast and pray, so you will not do all those things again. Listen. Except you are born again, except Christ lives in you, you cannot have the victory over sin, victory over Satan, and victory over the world. It is the presence of Christ and the power of Christ and the grace of God in your life that will give you the victory. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And these are the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, our faith in Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And when you are saved, victory will come. Who you see that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. First John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 13. First John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 13. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. When you are in the Lord and you keep on growing in the Lord, by listening to the word of God, accepting the word of God, meditating upon the word of God, standing on the word of God, on the truth of the promises of the word of God. It gives you the victory. You overcome because you are strong and the word abides in you. Look at verse 14. I have reached unto you, fathers, because ye have known him. That is from the beginning. I have reached unto you, young men, because ye are strong and the word of God abides in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. When the word of God abides in you, that's how you overcome. Do you know some people, they hear the word of God, as our people say, it comes in through one ear and goes out through the other ear. We don't overcome that way. If you're a forgetful hearer, you'll not overcome. But when the word of God abides in you, the word of his grace and the word of his power, you hear it, you accept it, you receive it, you meditate on it, and you believe it, and you are walking on it, and you are walking by that word, it is that word of God abiding in you that keeps you victorious. And the people that sing the song of victory and the song of worship in the Revelation chapter 15 we are reading about, they are the people that have the victory. And you can have the victory, and you don't have to wait until that time before you sing your own song. You can have victory over sin and victory over everything the devil throws at you. And then you can be joyful and celebrate with songs of praise. Even now, as the Lord gives you the victory, how much, what else do we need so we can have the victory? First Peter chapter 5. In First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober. 
be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a running lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour the, the devil is looking for those who make to backslide and if you are the careless life the frivolous type and the one that doesn't think about his life the devil will overcome you but if you are sober and vigilant and you are watching at every turn and you know the devil can come at any time and you are watching you watch your language and you watch your step and you watch your life and you watch your relationships with people and as you go to the place of work, there are sinners there. There are unbelievers there. Those unbelievers want to pull you down if you are watchful. That is the time you'll be able to have the victory. But if you are the careless type, you just come to the Bible study, you hear the word of God, you don't soak in, assimilate the word of God, and you go to the street, you go to the community, you go to the places you live, you go everywhere. You just live a careless life. You're not watching, you're not vigilant. You will not be able to overcome. But if you're sober, vigilant, because you know that your adversary the devil as a running lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And then it says in verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. He will bring suggestions to you. It will tell you to compromise. It will suggest things to you that ought not to be done by Christians. Immorality, fornication, adultery, covetousness, stealing. It will suggest a lot of things. Going to traditional medicine sellers. It will suggest a lot of things. How are you going to have victory over them? Because you resist all those suggestions. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are, are, afflictions are accomplishing your brethren, which are in the world, that are in the world. That's how you overcome. And I pray you will overcome. And then that victory will make you to sing. You know, how do you know a real victorious Christian? A singing Christian, always happy, always joyful, because the Lord is giving him the victory. It tells us in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And he overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And he loved not their lives unto the death. They overcame him by the word of their testimony, and by the blood of the Lamb. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Those are the people that overcome. They have taken their decision. They have made up their minds. And it doesn't matter what may be happening around them or before them. They take their stance and they say, I've opened my mouth unto the Lord. I will not go back. Even it will, it will mean suffering. I'm still going to move on in the Lord. Those are the people that overcome. But the people that have a little challenge, a little problem, a little difficulty. And then they give up. And they say, I thought it would be easy. I didn't know it would be as hard as this. Those, are, those people cannot overcome. If you are going to overcome, believe on the Lord. And then in the blood of the Lamb that has shed for us on the cross of Calvary. And then the word of your testimony. Positive confession saying, I know the Lord is with me. And I know the Lord will give me the victory. Greater I see that is in me than he that is in the world. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can overcome. Let the weak say, I am strong. I know I am strong in the Lord. You overcome by the word of your testimony. And then you do not love your lives until the day. That means that whatever the devil throws at you. And whatever threats the devil may pose to you. You say, I am going to stand. Those are the people that overcome. Come back to Revelation chapter 15. And we're looking at it now from verse 3. It says, and they sing the song of Moses. And the servant of God. And the song of the Lamb. Saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. I just told you now that that's how the people of Israel, the children of Israel, that's how they sang. When they came out of the Red Sea, in Exodus chapter 15, reading from verse 1, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his horse, as he cast into the sea, his chosen captains on 
also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank in into the, into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, as thou overthrown them that rose up against thee, thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as trouble. And with the blast of his of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, and the floods stood upright as an him, and the and the dead were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My Lord shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow of the, of the wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretched out thy right hand. They hast swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. And thou hast guarded them in thy strength. Unto thy holy habitation the people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on it inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall, hold, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as steel, as a stone, till thy people pass over. O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased, thou shalt bring them in. And plant them in the mountain of the, of the Lord, and which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hand hath established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Give me a good amen there. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with, the, with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. You see how they sang to the Lord because of what the Lord had done for them. The same thing at the time of the great tribulation. The people that have gotten the victory over the mark of the beast and over the number of his name. They will sing unto the Lord because of the good of the Lord upon them. In fact, we are told in Revelation chapter 7, look at it, Revelation chapter 7, looking at it from verse 9. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. It says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, the living creatures. And they fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are rich in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that seated on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sunlight on them uh, and no any heed and then it says for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto the fountains of waters the living fountains of waters and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes you see that's what the lord is telling us that if we if we are victorious eventually we'll be with the redeemed of the lord and we'll sing the song of the lord and we'll sing with the saints of god look at verse 3 again that is revelation chapter 15 verse 3 it says and he sing the song of moses the servant of god and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Listen to this. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. 
And I tell you, remember they are singing the song of the Lamb. The song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the King of glory and the King of saints. The Lord of laws. Revelation chapter 17 verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is the Lord of laws and the King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Still talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19 verse 16. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Come back to Revelation chapter 15 now verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Who shall not fear thee, O Lord? And glorify thy name. And the Lord has told us that we ought to fear a God in heaven. And these uh, victorious saints, they were saying, who will not fear you? King of kings, Lord of lords, the one that is able to judge, who will not be afraid of the judgment that will come upon the rebellious, upon the sinners. In Luke chapter 12, reading verses 4 and 5. Luke chapter 12 verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear, fear him, which after he has killed, has part or cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And that's why these victorious saints were asking, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? In Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. We're looking at it from verse 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing, with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why sinners ought to be afraid. Sinners ought to tremble in the presence of the Lord and call upon the Lord and repent. Because when the Lord comes, he'll come in flaming fire. He'll take vengeance on them that do not know God. He'll take vengeance on the people that do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and shall be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day wherefore also we pray you always we plead with you always we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith were power that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us um, in Revelation chapter 15, once again, Revelation chapter 15, I'm reading verse 4. It says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. All nations, all nations, all nations shall come and worship before thee. Again, you need to remember that these things are not completely new in Revelation. Actually, it's been prophesied in the past that nations shall come before the Lord and they will worship the Lord. We're told in Psalm 22, Psalm 22, verses 27 and 28, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is a governor among the nations. The governor among the nations. Psalm 86. In Psalm 86, reading from verse 9. Psalm 86, reading from verse 9. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great, and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, 
and I will glorify thy name forevermore. And so as we read and as we study Revelation chapter 15, we learn that the people that have gotten the victory over the mark of the beast and over the beast himself and over his image, they will sing unto the Lord and then they will glorify the Lord and they will desire that all people will honor the Lord, all people will glorify the Lord, all people will fear the name of the Lord. We'll come to the latter part, the last part of this Revelation chapter 15 now from verse 5. Revelation chapter 15 from verse 5. It says, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having seven plates, clothed in pure and white, white linen, and having their breasts guarded with golden girdles. And one of the four bees gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Here we learn of the source of the power and the source of the vials of the wrath coming upon the people of the earth. After seeing the revelation of the vision of the singing redeemed people, singing the song of deliverance and the song of their Lord's dominion, John the Beloved now saw the temple in heaven and that temple was open. And it's not the first time he's going to see the temple. This is not the first time the temple was even opened. In Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11, reading from verse 19. Revelation 11, verse 19, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of, the test, of, the test, of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. But at this time now, when he saw the temple opened in heaven, he saw seven angels coming out of that temple. What's the signification or the significance of that? That means that seven angels who are appointed to execute the plagues of judgment on the earth, they'll be coming from the very presence of God, the immediate presence of the Lord. Because the temple is referred to you as the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony, which means it's bearing testimony to the presence of God and the power of God and the preeminence of God in that temple. And those seven angels are coming from the very presence of God, the immediate presence presence of God and they were given seven golden bars full of the wrath of God. The judgment and the wrath of God upon the earth will be full. They will be final without allowance, any allowance for mercy. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from the power of the Lord. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. The smoke actually here is the manifestation of the appearance of the majesty of the almighty God. And when the final fury and wrath will be poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth, then that uh, it, uh, it has been appointed as the time of the end time judgment. There will be no man that will be able to enter into the temple to make any intercession or turn away the wrath of God from the people at that time. And that's the reason why if you're going to seek for the mercy of God, this is the time. If you want the salvation of God, this is the time. Look at Psalm 75 verse 8. Psalm 75 verse 8. And you will see that these scriptures support the things we have read about now in the book of Revelation 75 verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. And the wine is red. It is full of mixture. And it, it poureth, it poureth out of the same. And it drags thereof. All the wicked of there shall wring them out and drink them. That is the indignation that is coming, the wrath that is coming. The outpouring of the wrath of God will be upon the wicked of the earth, upon the sinners on earth, upon the people that have not repented, that have not given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. I must ask you again, where do you stand? How are you today in the Lord? Are you in the Lord? Or you are playing religion? Or you have not come to the Lord? All the wicked people, all the unrepentant people, all the impenitent people, all the people that are living in sin, if you continue like that, you are going to drink of the cup of the wrath of God. In Jeremiah chapter 25, reading from verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 15. For thus says the Lord God of Israel unto me, 
take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it, and it shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took, then I, then took I the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me. In verse 18, he continues to say, to tell you all the people that are going to drink of that wrath of God, to weed Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof, and the princes thereof to make them a desolation and astonishment and his sin and then it curse as it is this day so then all the people that do not actually know the lord the wrath of god will come upon them ephesians chapter 5 in ephesians chapter 5 here again we see the wrath of god manifested from heaven toward over the people that do not know the lord do not love the lord do not obey the gospel of our lord jesus christ ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 3 but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as becometh saints every faithful preacher of the word will warn Believers were one, church members were one, everyone of the indignation of God, of the wrath of God. Every faithful preacher of the word will warn backsliders and sinners in the church or outside the church of the coming wrath of God, of the judgment of God. And look at the warning here fornication or all uncleanness or covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. There are some people that play with sin. There are some people that get too near sin. And you see, after all, it's just a little sin. And, and you know, when, when, you, when you see people who minimize the gravity of sin, and then they tell you, and they say, well, I didn't do the real sin. What's the real sin? I didn't commit fornication. I about uncleanness. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a sin. Neither filthiness. The filthy things that people do. And the polluting, corrupting things that people do. And the sinful things that people get involved in. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For ye know, this ye know, that no monger, no adulterous person, no fornicator, no, no adulterer, no adulteress, no unclean person, no covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, listen to this, cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. If we do not obey the gospel, if we do not believe in the Lord, if we do not give ourselves to the Lord, judgment will come. And it's because of these things, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the anger of God, the fury of God comes upon the children of disobedience. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 26. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, it tells us, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. What does that mean? If we sin willfully, uh, you know, there are some people uh, that you're not even tempted. It's not that you have any temptation, but you just say, ah, all these years I've just been living righteous and living holy and living upright. And um, all these things they are doing in the world, I don't even know the taste of them. And then deliberately you plunge yourself into evil. If we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour, shall consume the adversaries. He that despised Moses, Lord, died without mercy. Under two or three witnesses of how much sorrow punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. You see that? Those who were sanctified before, 
they were purged before they were purified before they were made holy before then later they go back into sin and they despise the son of god and they despise the blood of the lamb and they count that an unholy thing i have done despite unto the spirit of grace for we know him who has said that has said vengeance belongeth unto me i will recompense says the lord and again the lord shall judge his people it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's why the Lord is warning us and the Lord is telling us that we shall flee from the wrath to come. We shall flee from the judgment of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, I'm looking at it from verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Here John the Baptist, like a faithful preacher, warning the people that came to him. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he says unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. John the, John the Baptist said, hey, You Pharisees who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. The wrath is coming. The judgment is coming. And it is going to be the fiery indignation of God upon the people that have not repented. They have not yielded to the voice of the Lord, calling them to repent and to turn to the Lord. And then it says, if you are repenting and you want to escape the judgment of God, you must repent. And then show the fruit. And you bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is, shall be hewn down and shall be cast into the lake of fire. Into the fire. And that's why the Lord is warning us. And the Lord is saying this is time to wake up. And this is the time to call upon the Lord. There's a line that is drawn by rejecting the Lord. When the call of his spirit is lost, the spirit of God will not always warn you. And the spirit of God will not always come and say, repent, repent. A time comes when the call of the spirit is lost. And then you hurry along with the pleasure mat throng. Are you counting the cost today? You may batter your hope of eternity small for a moment of joy at the most. You're thinking that if I do that, I'll have some temporary joy and some temporary satisfaction. And then you exchange your soul with the things you are trying to gain at this very time. But what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? And because of the glitter of sin and the things it will win, you're doubling into sin. Are you counting the cost? While the door of mercy is still open to you today. Before the death of the love of God you exhaust, won't you come and be saved? Won't you whisper, I yield, I have counted the cause, I have counted the cause. If you don't repent, where are you going to spend eternity? The question is coming to you today. Tell me, what shall your answer be if you are not born again? Coming to the Bible study, coming to the church and reading the Bible and mixing with the people of God. Where are you going to spend eternity? Many are choosing Christ today. They are turning from all their sins away. Heaven shall be their happy portion. But for you, where are you going to spend eternity? If you leave the straight and the narrow way. And you go the downward road, sad will your final ending be. You'll be lost throughout an unending eternity. But you can repent today, you can believe this very hour and trust in the Savior's grace and power. And then, after you have repented, you've called upon the name of the Lord. And there's a change in your life. And you are bringing forth the fruit of righteousness. Then, will your happy and joyous answer be, I'm born again, I'm saved, I'm forgiven, I'm passed from condemnation unto life eternal, saved through a long eternity. Eternity, eternity. Tell me today, where will you spend eternity? Rise up and talk to the Lord. We're going to have some time to pray. 
in all the other locations where you have heard the word of God, we're going to spend time to pray. We didn't come to just fill our heads with knowledge. We want the word of God to touch our hearts. We want the Lord to turn us around because the time of judgment is coming. The time of his indignation will come. And you want to make sure that you get ready because you do not want to spend eternity in the lake of fire. Today is the time to call upon the Lord. Where are you going to spend eternity? Call upon the name of the Lord today. Eternity, eternity. Where will you spend eternity? Let's call on the name of the Lord. Let's call on the name of the Lord. Let the Lord touch your heart today. If you are living in any secret sin, this is the time to call on the name of the Lord and to say, Yes, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. The sin of fornication, the sin of adultery, the sin of lying, the sin of fraud, the sin of deception, and the sin of stealing, the sin of hypocrisy. You will call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Give yourself to the Lord. Be born again. That's the reason we're coming to the Bible study. So we can escape the final fury of God and the final wrath of God and the final judgment of God. Be faithful to yourself and be faithful to the Spirit of God. As the Spirit of God is striving with your heart, striving with your soul, and telling you, reminding you, you're not living right. You're not living upright. You're not living a righteous life. And you're not all right in the sight of the Lord. If the trumpet shall sound today, you'll be lost. As the Lord is being faithful to you and the Lord is talking to you, this is the time to talk to him and say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. I surrender myself to you. I give myself to you. Lord, have mercy upon me. Forgive my sin. Forgive my sin. Turn me around. Change my life. The Lord will do it. The Lord will do it. Give yourself to the Lord today and then you will escape the wrath of God. You'll escape the judgment of God. If you are not born again, this is the time to be born again. You are counting the cost. You are counting the cost. What if you are lost? What if you are lost? What if you die without salvation? An accident may happen. Anything can happen. What if you die without salvation? Where will you spend eternity? Isn't your soul precious to you? Isn't eternal life important to you? Isn't fellowship of the Lord important to you? Where will you spend eternity? Call upon the name of the Lord. The Lord is calling you. The Lord is calling you. The Lord is calling you. Why will you perish? Why will you perish? Why will you die in your sin? Why don't you call upon the name of the Lord and abandon this sin? Is the temporary enjoyment of sin so important you want to lose your soul and go to hell fire forever? Wrath is coming. Judgment is coming. Indignation is coming. The fiery judgment of God will fall upon the people that have not repented. You need to call upon the name of the Lord so that when the rapture will take place, when the Lord will come, you will be able to go with the saints of God. When the saints of God go marching in, you'll be among the redeemed of the Lord. But if you are careless with your soul, if you are careless with your life, if you are living in sin, if you will not surrender yourself to the Lord, if you will not turn away from sin, if you will not have the grace of God in your life, then you'll be lost for all eternity. And you'll be suffering. And you remember you were told. You remember you were warned. But you did not heed the warning of the Lord. You became careless. And you took things of this as more important than your soul, than your salvation. And you took the things that are worthless and useless, more important than knowing the Lord. And then you'll be lost. Then you'll be lost. And you'll be with that rich man in hell fire. And you'll be regretting for all eternity. You'll be regretting for all eternity. But today is the day of mercy. And today is the day of grace. And today is the day of the love of God. You can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And then when you are saved... You can have the grace to live a righteous life. The grace that brought salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously in this present world. Jesus Christ died for us that may purge us and purify us and redeem us from all iniquity. And you can tell the Lord, O oh Lord, here am I. O oh Lord, here am I. You want him to redeem you from all iniquity and then purify you and make you zealous of good works. He can do it. He can do it. He can do it. Allow him to do it today. If you have not been saved, today is the day of salvation. If you have not been sanctified, the Adamic nature has not been uprooted in your heart, today is that day. It says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. 
and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your uncleanness, and you will be clean. And then it says, I will take away the stony heart out of you, the stubborn heart out of you, the self-will out of you. The Lord will sanctify you. He will break that hard heart. He will take the stony heart out of you, and he will give you the heart of flesh. Then you'll be able to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness will be your watchword. Holiness will be within. Holiness will be without. Holiness will be in your language. Holiness will be in everywhere, every part of your life. Holiness unto the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, that's what I want. Remember, remember, blessed are the pure in heart, only they shall see the Lord. And if you thirst and hunger after righteousness, then you'll be filled. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am, here I am. I want my heart to be filled with your love, with your righteousness, with your holiness, with your purity. Break up your fallow ground. Sow to yourself in righteousness. It is time to seek the Lord until he raises righteousness upon you. It is time to seek the Lord until he raises righteousness upon you. Allow him to walk in your heart. Allow him to walk in your soul. Allow him to purify you. Allow him to purge you. Allow him to sanctify you. Allow him to get you ready for the coming of the Lord. Let him do it. Let him do it. If you are coming to the Bible study, you are not saved. Coming is, is useless. If you are coming to the Bible study and you don't escape hell fire, coming is useless. It's worthless. The reason you are coming, the reason you are learning the word of God is that this word of God will so impact your life. I will so influence your life. And then there will be a change, a mighty change, a transformation in your heart, in your life, in your behavior, in your character. That the word of God will leave an indelible mark in your life. That you will be able to say, thank God I heard. And thank God I listened. And thank God I prayed. And thank God I yielded. Thank God I surrendered. And thank God it has made an impact in my life. That's why you are coming, to get you ready for the coming of the Lord. That's why you are the Bible study. That's why you are studying. So that this word of God you are hearing, this word of God you are hearing, will prepare you and make you ready for the coming of the Lord. But if you are not saved, how are you ready? If you are not made righteous and holy, how are you ready? If you are not sanctified, how are you ready? If you don't give yourself fully to the Lord, how are you ready? If you are having condemnation and you are weak and you are falling into sin every time, how are you ready? But when you allow the blood of the Lamb to purge you, you allow the blood of the Lamb to purify you, the blood of the Lamb to make you holy, you become a new creature in Christ. All things pass away, all things become new. That's when you are ready for the coming of the Lord. Let the word of God do it today. Let the word of God do it today. Let the word of God do it today. The soul be vigilant. The devil is looking for whom he will pull into hell. But you tell the Lord, I will not allow the devil to take me to hell. I am going to allow the word of God to work mightily, effectually in my life. And he who has called you is faithful. Who will do it? He will save you if you want salvation. He will sanctify you if you want sanctification. If you make you holy, if you really want to be holy, and then you'll be able to share testimonies with others, and your life will draw other people to know the Lord. You will be able to live that life that is victorious. And then on that final day, you'll be singing the song of redemption, the song of rejoicing, and the song of, uh, of, uh, of the Redeemer. You'll be singing on that final day. You tell the Lord before you go and say, Lord, do something in me.